So today I'm interviewing Gianmarco Melli, who is uh, an e-commerce business owner who has a very interesting uh, take on how to build systems and processes in your company. Hi, Gianmarco. How, how are you doing? Hi, hi, Renaud. Yeah, good to see you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm doing well. Uh, good to see you here. Yeah. yeah so do you... Do you want to give a uh, an, an intro about yourself so the, the, yes. the listeners uh, have a little bit of an idea about what you've been doing and so on? Yes, for sure. So I am originally from Italy. Uh, I moved to China right after university. Uh, and that's where my basic, basically my entrepreneurial uh, life started, you know, right away after university. I, I, I barely worked for a company for a few months. And then they they fired me because I was working on my own project. So the my own project was you know like a, a, a like a grocery store on uh, uh, in China selling uh, uh, foreign products like from the U.S., Europe, Australia mm. uh, into China. Uh, that was a very difficult job, but uh, I had a I had a Chinese partner, and um, uh, we also got you know investments from a VC. Uh, it was okay, you know, the first uh, year or two, uh, but then, you know, it kind of, you know, went south because uh, I, I was very young at 24, my first uh, startup, and I did basically all the mistakes in the book. <laughs> so uh, in the meantime, I adapted and uh, and I, I switched uh, basically business model because then I started selling on, on Amazon in Western countries, sourcing from China. So I did the opposite. Uh, and that actually went very well until until now. I do have the same brand, which we we develop, you know, uh, home and kitchen brands, uh, manufacturing in China, selling in in Western countries, in in five countries in in, in West in the Western world. Um, that has been like a great experience for me, and you know, now I, I can share uh, a lot. <laughs> and in the meantime, I I created uh, this podcast called the Seller Process, where I share. Uh, where I interview um, uh, different experts in e-commerce, uh, you guys can find also uh, my interview with Renault. <laughs> uh, right, and, right, uh, that was a few weeks back. Yes, yes, exactly. A few weeks back, we we had an interview uh, on product development. So yeah, I interview all the experts, and uh, um, we share about uh, systems and processes that e-commerce sellers can adopt in their business to be more successful. So that's in a nutshell, you know, what I'm doing. I also do like some coaching uh, and have some um, uh, like digital products to help people to improve their business. Right. So yeah. the main the main focus of, of, of your podcast and the, the whole website at uh, thesellerprocess.com is, yes. is really all about yeah processes. Okay. Thinking of your business like sort of like a machine that you tune and how to actually uh, do that the right way to to support you and so on. And that's what we're going to talk about today because this is really uh, your uh, sort of your superpower or your, your passion or, or both of them, I guess. Um, <laughs> and this yes. is going to be uh, mostly in the context of companies that sell products in e-commerce and buy these uh, products that they sell in, let's say, low-cost Asia, right? Like China, Vietnam, India, these kinds of places, because I guess it's, it's mostly applicable to all of this. Uh, it's not just for selling on Amazon. It's also for companies that sell on, uh, you know, their website with Shopify and, 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 and things like that, right? So, um, yes, I, I have a few questions uh, for you and, uh, you know, so that people can really get some some insights about your approach and to to sort of understand it, you know, a little bit better. Um, so, the first question is: um, Let's say I'm an e-commerce. Um, I, I want to set up my e-commerce brand. Okay, uh, I'm I'm starting. I'm just starting, and I'm thinking: Okay, well, you know, there's the buying and there's the the, the keeping in inventory and there's the selling and like this there's, there's the marketing to reach the people and 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 all of that and more and more and more right um where should i start to systematize the systems and processes because i can't like have the whole operations book ready on day one right that just doesn't make sense so where would you say that they probably need to start 
Yes, yes. So definitely, it's a, it's a question that applies to most uh, people when they when they're starting. They might uh, feel like it's a daunting task to create, you know, documentation around their their processes. Uh, most people don't even that are not even aware of what an SOP is. But uh, essentially, you not know, everybody actually uh, work with them in their mind. You know, an SOP is is essentially you know the uh, documentation uh, written or in a video form. Um, or it can be like in a graphical form, like a flow chart or something like that, that basically uh, explains the um, how a process works. So uh, you you whenever you do something in your business, that there is some there are some steps that you follow. You may not be aware of that because it's just in your mind, but the the whole purpose of this is to uh, start systematizing your business in a way that. Uh, those processes that are in your in your mind get you know transferred into documents that can be then passed along to other team members in the future, but also create like uh, a structure like an order in your business. Okay, you don't so, want to you know yeah yeah just to um, Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> to make it a bit like you know easy to grasp uh, for people maybe who are new to this concept. Let's say for example, I learn how to drive. Let's say and then. They really have to drill into my head. Okay, I sit down in the car, I put on the seat belt, you know, maybe I make sure it's on neutral if it's a stick. Then I I, I turn. Maybe even like first I I, I press the uh, whatever the, the clutch and, the, and 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 the brake pedals, and then I, I I turn it on and I look right and left. Where am I? Do I need to turn on the lights? Right. And then. You know, I know where I'm going and then I go, you know, I go, you know, clutch and first gear and go. So if you, if you skip some of the steps here, um, it's a bit dangerous. Like, oh, I forget to put on the seatbelt, you know, something like that. Um, right. And if you do, if you, if you do things in the wrong order or something, uh, it actually is not going to work. Right. Like, exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah, it's already yes. in gear number one, and I turn, and then like, oh, boom! You know, I I um, <laughs> I, I, I crashed or something. So I I need to restart from from scratch. So what you're saying is that when you say people have it in their minds, you mean that you know I log in the bank account. First, I have to log in anyway; it's a must, and then I need to see. Okay, oh, I have a list of things to pay. Okay, I go there. But then what you're saying is well. When I'm gonna make a payment, maybe I'm gonna double check if I really have the invoice from these guys. If the bank account corresponds to uh, to the name of the company that I'm selling that I'm I'm, I'm buying from, otherwise I'm gonna ask some extra question, uh, etc. Mm-hmm. etc. Right? If you don't do that from time to time, you might get scammed easily. Right? So is right. this a good example? Yes, can be it can be applied to anything uh, for sure. So uh, in in this case, for example, there are like uh, processes that must have certain steps. So uh, that's why I'm saying it's useful to to put put these steps down on paper or on a video, even if you don't have any team, because uh, that that's kind of a, a common misconception that people think that uh, they are just working by themselves, so they don't need processes or SOPs. What I'm saying actually is exactly what what uh, what you mentioned. Uh, you want to have those processes even just for yourself. Just not to forget, you know, the critical steps that you might miss out if you don't have it written down because, you know, you might be tired that day or you just forget about that, right? So you want to make sure that you always follow the the, the right uh, steps, right? So that that's that's a critical. I think it's just just a, a mindset shift. So when that is clear, then uh, the the way I I suggest people. Um, structuring this process of systematizing their business is first of all to gain awareness of how do how they spend their time. Okay, this is critical because um, um, we go on autopilot uh, most of our time, and uh, uh, especially when you're starting a business, especially if it's your first business, you don't have much control of the majority of the things that are going on, and and it can it can become very soon very messy. Because a business, it's it's a bunch of you know systems uh, putting uh, uh, working together, and you can you can miss out the big picture and what's going on very quickly if you are into the weeds of the daily operations. 
So what you want to do is to stop and gain awareness of your time. So uh, a, a tool that I, I call the time tracker and the task tracker. So uh, I suggest to use, to use that. Uh, I can also share it with, uh, with links. Uh, there is also in my website. Yeah. We'll, what it we'll is it is basically, yeah, yeah. So, what it, yeah, what it is basically is um, you know, going through your day and uh, putting into into a table uh, the activities that you're working on, okay? And uh, do this exercise uh, in a very detailed way, okay? Not just uh, uh, looking at emails or, or working, you know, like you need to be very specific on what, what you're actually doing in that time, okay? So after a week, you will find this is like a, an enriching experience because you will you will understand how badly most of the time you're using your time and uh, and then you know you start categorizing this the task all the tasks that you found in during uh, that happened during your week you start to categorizing it in in certain ways uh, so that you can do something about it so the category the, the main categories are uh, three like eliminate uh, um, delegate or optimize okay so first of all you need to figure out whether that task needs to be done at all. Sometimes you, it's not even necessary, you know? So you're doing something more work than, than necessary. Uh, so first thing, this is a hierarchy, okay? So uh, it's, it's exactly in the order that I said, okay? It's not mm -hmm. random. So first of all, you need to think whether you can eliminate that task or not, whether it's necessary. Okay, so let's say if it's, if it's not necessary, throw it away. If it is necessary, so it must be done, then you need to figure out, okay, how can I delegate that? Or you ask yourself, can I delegate that? And when I mean delegate, it's also like in a very general term, like giving this to some someone or, or something else. So it can be also like an automation, for example, okay? And, and automation go, so in the hierarchy, automations go first before people. Because it's better to to have machines doing some, doing something for you, you instead of people, right? So, um, how can you automate this task? Can you automate partially? Uh, that's some that's a very important question because people say, okay, I cannot automate uh, PPC campaigns because it's it's a the, it involves a lot of you know mental thinking. But yeah, but you can automate like bid optimization, which is you know like a small part of the overall process. Okay, so you need to think like very granularly about the process itself and understand what pieces of that process can be automated, delegated, or eliminated, or optimized. Okay, so we're going through this process. It's an it's a it's an endless process uh, of keeping eliminating, delegating, automating, and optimizing everything in your workday. And um, this is going to give you so much more control over your business. You will feel much better uh, when managing your business. Uh, so then the, 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 the other things we mentioned is delegating. So if it cannot be automated by uh, uh, some tools or an automation, then you can delegate it to a team member, a VA or someone else. Last step is optimizing. So if you cannot give it to anybody, or not eliminating, you need to do it by yourself, but then how can you optimize it? So like cutting pieces of the of the process, make it shorter, um, uh, doing all, all kinds of you know optimization that will improve the 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 outcome of that task. You see, you see how this process is an iterative process. So the more you do it, the more basically your your business is gonna look like a, a, a a well-oiled machine where everything goes smoothly and, and keeps keeps improving. You know? So you need to have this mindset of like continuous improvement. Okay. Mm. So this is this is what I um what I suggest uh, mm. uh to, to implement so, to the, the mindset to implement. If I if I reword it in in, in yeah in my own words basically yeah. okay you try to see Okay, what do I spend a lot of time on, right? You 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 want to become aware of what you're doing, and then you 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 when you look first at what takes you a lot of time, right? And first you look at it and you say, okay, do I need to actually take all of these steps when I'm doing this, right? Like for example, oh, it takes a lot of time to follow up with the suppliers. Oh, actually, 
it takes me like five uh you know five uh, emails just to schedule the next call how about we just set okay it's going to be monday uh, 9 a.m and that's it every week recurring right so already tick right. already already removed that little these five emails already removed okay eliminated then right. i think okay um how to optimize um no sorry delegate okay can i delegate something here um, maybe not really but oh, wait a minute maybe i can uh, ask them in advance every time to prepare uh, like a little status report or something Okay, boom, I give them some some work. So they prepare and then we, we review that together and the call can be half as long. And then, exactly. uh, okay, what can I um, optimize? Well, maybe I will have like always as a standard, like the same three questions. So I don't mm -hmm. have to think of what to do and so on. And they will, over time, they will expect these questions. So they will already be prepared. So this, this is a, a an example, right? Exactly. Uh, and, and you would start with the activity that take you the most time uh, th does that make sense yes yes absolutely so um if we if we want to then take it a step further uh, i have like a few kind of uh, uh tips on on what what i look for when i when i want to delegate something or want to uh yeah pass on certain tasks so uh one is that i i create like a matrix uh w where uh, on one end is a frequency and one average time so basically you you know you categorize these tasks on a frequency like how frequently they happen if if if, if the, it's it's a daily uh, type of task or it's a weekly or monthly or quarterly <clears throat> okay then uh, the other thing is the average time so like how much time it's taking you every time you do that task? Is it like a 15 minutes thing, one hour or several hours? Okay, so then basically from this, this matrix, you understand that, you know, your highest priority and time consuming thing are the high frequency, high average time uh, tasks, right? Uh, and so those those are your first priority to tackle. So you will you will need to really go deep into those like high frequency high average time um type of tasks so that you know you optimize delegate automate those first because that's your that's your lowest hanging fruits right right um right. so uh once you you take care of that then maybe it, may, it might take even months to to fully optimize a, a process uh, because you are doing it while actually performing it, the task, so you you cannot stop right. the machine and you're not gonna, gonna stop the business and say, wait, let me take care of this. You need to keep doing it while you are optimizing, right? So it may take mm -hmm. long time, but uh, it's gonna save you a lot of time. Um, mm -hmm. Then you know a, a few quick tips that I have, you know, on what to focus on next, like how to prioritize. So this is this is uh, definitely one, this matrix, frequency, average time. The second one is like uh, uh, taking care of like, first of the simple repetitive tasks. Uh, it doesn't matter how much time they take you, but if it's a simple thing that uh, do not require your level of expertise or knowledge, th those are, you know, like good, good type of tasks that can be delegated to someone else mm, um, right. because mm -hmm. it, it's simple. You know already how to perform them so you can easily transfer your knowledge to someone else. And uh, this other person will not need to have your same knowledge and expertise. So it's easy to transfer. Last yeah, it's one. Easier. Yeah. It's, oh, sorry, just to clarify. Yeah. You mean that if something doesn't, yeah, doesn't need you can be done by somebody else and it can be boiled down to okay you do these five steps and here's an example then like a virtual yeah. assistant in the philippines or somebody like this could do it for maybe exactly. you know 10 15 dollars an hour or something right a lot okay. of our a lot of our clients uh resort to uh virtual assistants uh in exactly. in a lot of different countries and and this is typically what they do yeah yeah, yeah, definitely. It's it's a great opportunity to, you know, take off your plate some of the tasks and, you know, start gaining back more time so that you can invest that time into optimizing more important tasks and, and you know, creating more value in the company, right? 
Um, then, you know, the last, the last one, the last way I, I use to kind of think what to prioritize is uh, what do you think about? What do you hate or dislike or you are not good at? Um, e even just as a, here, uh, I'm talking like kind of as a life coach, let's say, like you, you just, you don't want to uh, get your energy drained uh, into like this task that you hate or dislike or you're not good at, right? So th those are also like high priority in the list of, you know, delegation because otherwise you're going to hate your job. You're going to, uh, you're not going to enjoy, you know, doing business and, and uh, that's going to be reflected in everything else. And just the energy that you will bring in, it will not match, you know, well, your, your expectations. So you, you will have, you know, um, bad time, you know, working. So you don't want to be miserable. <laughs> so yeah, totally. So yeah. some tasks basically give you energy, like working with yeah. certain people, working on certain types of tasks give you energy, right? Maybe you look forward to them, and some other tasks actually drain energy away from you, and you tend to procrastinate and so on. Yeah. So if you can just get rid of that, your entire yeah. life gets better, right? Exactly. Yeah, true, true, true. So, yeah, yeah. They, they should definitely uh, think about like a high priority to, to you know, improve your life in general. Yeah, yeah that, that makes a lot of sense. So all the tips you have given so far, uh, their objective is to um, to allow people to, to basically to have more time for the things that they do best or the things that maybe are most important to their business. Um, what about uh risks because when you do um basically when you import products and you know you you buy products you know one batch at a time it's probably gonna be you know tens of thousands of dollars and and more very fast um and mm. and you if you make one mistake and another mistake maybe the entire venture is is gone you know in the first few years you're just a couple of mistakes away from uh, going out of business sometimes mm -hmm. Does it help to have systems and processes to uh, to prevent this kind of mistake? Well, well, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, th that uh, you know always de depends on you know each different business have you know different ways to do that, but there there might be uh, like some kind of best practices for risk management, uh, specifically in case of importing or or then selling. So first importing. Uh, something that I do uh, in terms of like risk management is um, to have you know in instead of having uh, I I know that you know the 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 uh, main way that uh, most common way that uh, people do for example selling from Asia to to the U S for example is that they they have a big batch of production in their factory they send maybe a full container into a 3pl somewhere in the us they store it store the products there and then they uh, feed uh, whatever it is that the other uh, warehouses for example amazon fba or you know they ship it from there uh, i would say this is a, a bit more a risky approach in my my opinion you know the, the way i i manage this and uh, it works especially well for amazon fba uh, but it can be applied, you know, to, for other business model is that, first of all, I have a very good relationship with the factory and uh, um, we can dive deeper in maybe in how to get that good relationship. But um, once you, you, you uh, get, get, a, get a good, good relationship with them, you can negotiate uh, free storage in China, which I can, I can guarantee it's totally possible because all my factories do that you know like i work with four factories and all of them agreed on that so you just need to have maybe sometimes just the courage to ask you know no much more um and so they will be happy to store your product in china for free uh, some might just give you like a time limit maybe let's say no more than three months or something like that uh, but some of them it's kind of uh, almost endless. Um, so then uh, keep keep uh, products in China and then uh, do like small shipments on a weekly basis or every two weeks directly to the to Amazon FBA in this case. Uh, so I would not suggest to 
to have like a middleman to store the products in the US, unless just for some like buffer stock, because sometimes maybe sales go well and you just need like very quickly some some stock. But just keep maybe what I do is uh, like also as, as a risk management um, uh, pro process, I keep 30 days worth of inventory in a 3PL in the US just as a, as a buffer stock. It sometimes happen that influencers uh, pick your product and, and share it in social media and you like one day is like sales spike you know, for one or two days. Um, so you didn't expect that. Therefore, you have you know some inventory ready to go uh, nearby uh, an Amazon warehouse. But um, for your normal flow of inventories, restock, you, sh you stock directly from China to the US FBA, for example, uh, directly. So this basically, it helps you to uh, minimize you know, the problems with uh, each individual shipment because sometimes one shipment can get you know, uh, stopped at the customs or um, it, can, can, uh, it can be lost even. So, so if you if you send like a huge shipment, I would be kind of anxious to send like <laughs> in one go like hundred k worth of inventory. Uh, well, it obviously depends how big is your business. If one hundred k is just a small number for you, then uh, uh, do it. But uh, as a percentage of the overall, you know, need of the uh, inventory, you should feed you know like one or two weeks worth of inventory every week. Okay, so, so that, yeah, just, you have this constant flow. Right, just so I understand, uh, having a, a batch, let's say $100,000 made and then shipped at once to a uh, FBM kind of warehouse somewhere, maybe in uh, in Nevada or someplace like that to serve the US market, you say it's particularly uh, risky because you mean like if there's quality issues in the batch, then you're stuck with a, a, a batch that can be repaired uh, if you have bad feedback from the market, then you cannot sell it. These are the types of risks that you have in mind. Uh, also, yes, th that's definitely one. Uh, I was going, I was thinking to mention this when in the selling parts, let's say, of 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 uh, of this process. But uh, in the importing, yes, it, it's it's true as well because uh, uh, if you if you have you know everything in in the U.S. Uh, and then maybe some product needs re rework or you figure out that there was some problem with the product and it's already there, it's gonna be like very painful and expensive to get it back, right? But if you like do small shipments at a time, you know, you're gonna save money also in the shipment and um, and you 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 de-risk yourself from these things to happen. And, and go, going there, you know, in the selling part, so what I wanted to mention is like, um, Basically, the, the way the, the most the, the biggest risk you can have as an e-commerce seller is that you create a product, you send it to Amazon, for example, you start receiving the first few reviews, which are bad for some reasons, uh, because the product are, is not good. And you are basically stuck with all the inventory you created because you now have a, a listing on Amazon or on Shopify, wherever that has, you know, very low reviews and converts very badly. So uh, that that's basically the worst case scenario. So that's that's the risk that you can have mm -hmm. as a, as an e-commerce seller, right? The biggest risk. So what do you do with about that? Obviously, like quality inspections, it's a, it's a big thing. So when a when a production batch is ready. Make sure that you always have, you know, quality inspections. Um, as this is something I I even neglected in the beginning, like doing just uh, the the quality inspection the first time, and then you you understand, okay, it's it's fine, it's good, but you, you know you can be really like one bad batch away from you know this disruption because if it, if one batch is it's bad for some reason, you're gonna receive so many complaints and refunds and and uh, uh, bad reviews that are going to thank your product you know so it's really worth to spend that you know hundred two hundred dollars extra for for an inspection uh, and uh, you know make sure that everything is it's fine um, 
other than that, you know, in order to prevent this risk to happen is, you know, um, other risks could be compliance risks. So make sure you know the rules of the country where you're going to sell because uh, you might be surprised that then you sell a product and oh, you cannot sell this product <laughs> um, because it, it, it lacks of some some certifications or 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 some other mandatory labeling. labeling. Yeah, exactly. Some other mandatory requirements. So compliance is another thing. You know, I suggest you to have you know book some consultation with experts or there is a service that i like it's called compliance gate it's a friend yeah, of mine actually frederick yeah. was uh, was on your it's podcast. our friend actually so we'll, yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. so we'll um we'll also link to that episode of your podcast uh in 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 the show notes uh and also i mean another way to control risks yeah is to follow the proper new product introduction process when you develop a new product, right? We also talked exactly. about that. We'll, we'll also link to that episode of your podcast. Um, exactly. We, we're getting close to the end of the interview, but just my last question. I mean, you mentioned having a good uh, relationship with your factory helps. Um, is this related mostly to like setting systems and processes and showing them some predictability and so on? Or is this... Um, uh, you know, based on some other factors. Yeah, that's that's an interesting question because uh, uh, you know, the way I now I see everything, I, I can be systematized and you know documented. You know, so uh, if you come up with a strategy, then yes, you can document that strategy and then replicate the same the same things that you did for several different uh factories for example okay so in the beginning might be just something like spontaneous that you you just come up with uh, uh um you know like some ways to to build a relationship but then you can actually structure that so things that i i do is for example you know like small tiny things that uh, help you build that relationship um for example you know like no know, know the chinese uh, if if you're if you're sourcing from china know the chinese holidays for example and you know send them send them uh, like a hongbao it's, it's like the the red letter uh you know something like uh it, it's, it's basically a red envelope with uh with money inside so give them gifts uh, that they are accustomed for uh, during those days um you know maybe try try to speak the language yeah just just you know simple thing but you know it, it shows that you connect with them. You want to learn their language, you know. So uh, you you can try that too. Um, be interested in in their personal life. It's another good thing, you know, uh, because uh, these are human beings. You know, this is not a factory. It's just a machine. It, it these are you are interacting with with real people. So especially uh, in China. This yeah, exactly. In China. in China, there is this. Thing called Guan Xi, which is the the relation, the importance of relationships. And actually, Chinese are famous to do business only with people who have good relationship with. So um, maybe travel to China, have a dinner with them, and and drink some baijiu. You know, is the 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 Chinese wine. <laughs> I don't suggest to, to to drink too much because it's a very strong. <laughs> So everybody uh, doing business in China had, you know, uh, bad experiences with Baijiu, but um, it's it's a good way to connect with Chinese people, uh, like seeing them in person. Um, things things like that. Um, uh, if we need to go like more on a, on a business level, uh, things that I these are like more relationship based um, to show your kindness, to show that you are a human being and uh, and you care about them. Um, and uh, on a business level, uh, things that I do that I can I can suggest is that uh, I always use Alibaba. Um, after after you use Alibaba for a while, you will find it in your profile in the back end of your profile. It's written how much money you have spent in total in your Alibaba. So this to me now now that it's been many years, this to me is like a very strong um, kind of breaking uh like a break the ice type of uh thing uh because you know wh whenever i go to a new factory i say hey we are this company look at our profile we bought already like a million dollar on amazon on, on alibaba you know so uh they say oh 
this is this is a legit company you know they, these are um trustworthy company so right. you will right. start already with the right foot because um mm. you yeah, know they, they the, already know your your seizures right on top of the on top of the pile basically if if they have because companies that advertise on alibaba they, in some of the popular categories they might have you know 40 50 inquiries per day from new people right some of them they, it's it's amazing or even more and uh, and that's why they have like these you know dozen people uh, in sales you know responding to this in their office um so uh so what you're saying is that you immediately get priority you immediately get attention maybe from a supervisor or the manager oh this one is a real one and he's inquiring about that okay let's prioritize this versus the person who contacts them does which is very typical for, for for small buyers that don't have much experience they don't give a full brief about what they need and where they come from and everything is like there's like one or two liners and then and right. suppliers like if i have time i'll get to that and i also right. give them a, a two liner kind of response and and the link to okay you want to buy this or this this is the price and that's it right so you right. You, you from the beginning you want to catch their attention the right way yeah that makes a lot of sense yes yeah yeah exactly exactly uh, and then you know to go more practical also even uh, during the relationship where when when you, that's already your factor you know um let them be part of your team so share your wins for example this is like a big thing i found you know to be working uh, on my business so uh, the more we were growing the more we are growing the more you know i show them you know nice looking charts uh uh, that are you know upward charts of you know you, you can actually not manufacture them but uh show only the good ones obviously uh show the good ones to the to the supplier let them be excited about your business you say hey you know we're growing uh, look at this you know we're a team you know let's do it and they get excited too right so that makes you uh you know strengthen that relationship because now they feel part of your mission and then you can you can you know, you have this driving force together, like you and your suppliers are both part of the same team. And uh, I found that probably you, you have more experiences than me on this, but I found that uh, factories um, prefer frequent business, frequent orders versus big orders uh, once a year or once uh, every long time, you know. Um, so I, I found that they prefer like a monthly orders or or every two months instead of one big order in mm -hmm. every six or one six months or one year so yeah. that's kind of something that makes them feel like okay this guy is still in business it, it exists because uh, yeah, uh, many factories yes. yeah ha that's have something the experience. I would advise. Yeah, 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 yeah 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 many factories have the experience that you know there is a customer that promise a lot they make the first order and they disappear. <laughs> but you don't want to be that guy. You want to be, you know, the the good client, the good customer uh, that keep reordering, keep reordering. Um, yeah. yeah. And they might push you. They might push you for a big order because that that month they're not very busy. And also, if they have a big order, they can get like a deal from their component suppliers and so on, right? But you you might want to resist that. But if you have some visibility or at least some projections, you can show them, okay, this is what I'm going to order this year, you know, but I want to cut it so that I have also the cash to do the marketing and everything, right? And that's how we're going to exactly. grow. If I buy everything, then um, actually it's not going to help me sustain the growth over time. But if you give them the, the plan, the visibility, that's um, in general very attractive. As long as you yeah. you don't place very small orders, right? It's It's... Yes, I think right. It's, that's it's right. A very good approach. That's right. right. Yeah, yeah. Projection, obviously, are right. So uh, that that comes back to you know thinking of them as part of your team, right? So think that if you if you own the factory, if the factory was your own factory, you would obviously share with your team your forecast because so that you they are prepared to have you know the right raw materials in place whenever you are going to order. They don't want to have this surprise. Oh. oh I didn't know you were going to order so much. Uh, we now don't have raw material, so it's going to delay a lot. So obviously you would do that with your team. So this is actually part of your team, you know, your your factor, even if you don't own it, it they are part of your team. It's the uh, Their success is your success and vice versa. 
So, totally. so you need to share. Totally. You need to share those. Uh, at least, uh, yeah. At least three months ahead, give them an idea, even if it's not a PO. Yeah. I mean, that's what internally, right. you know, if, if internally the, the the sales team would have to tell that to the factory if it's in the same group. The factory will request it. Uh, you know, at least they need to have an idea. I need to have a forecast, right? Exactly. And, and some customers do it. It's part of the contract sometimes, uh, but then they have. They, they only commit to a PO, you know, with a short lead time, maybe two months, maybe 45 days, whatever. But yeah, longer forecast definitely helps. Um, yeah, this this has been really, really, uh, really helpful. Uh, Gianmarco Melli from the sellerprocess.com. Uh, and, uh, and you publish one uh, podcast episode focused on basically the kind of topics that we mentioned today um, every week, right? Yes, yes, yes. Sometimes, uh, you know, I'm very busy, so I skip it, but mostly every week, yes. Yeah, yeah, right, right. So uh, uh, I really recommend um, uh, your, your your podcast to people, especially in the e people who sell e-commerce, right? But there's, there's some uh, some episodes that are uh, applicable to any kinds of, of importers. And basically, everything we discussed today is applicable to any kind of importer, more on the small and medium-sized company, uh, but you'd be surprised. Sometimes you have some departments in big companies that, that are quite unstructured and, and do things in quite a messy way. So they would also uh, greatly benefit from listening to your advice here. <laughs> um, yes, yes, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank, thank you so much, Gianmarco. I'm sure the listeners uh, enjoyed this one. And uh, well, yeah. speak to you next time. Thank you, Renaudia. It was my pleasure. Yeah, thank you.